Welcome. My name is Alan Harder, along with Elsiana Harder and Bob Bear. And on behalf of the Emmanuel Mennonite Church, we welcome you to the Sanctuary of Worship. Whether you are in front of a, a screen on a computer, a cell phone, or a tablet, and whether you are at home, in nature, or on your way somewhere, you are in the Sanctuary of God. <clears throat> we want to make a special welcome to seniors in Menno Place and other seniors' residences. You are in God's presence. We welcome you from places far away and from places near. We welcome the heavy laden, those who are struggling with pain, and those who have glad hearts. Wherever we are gathered, God is there, creating a sanctuary in our hearts. We desire to gather our hearts in minds, in worship, and in praise. God of all glory and grace, you have given us minds to know you, and hearts to love you, and voices to sing your praise. Fill us with your spirit that we may celebrate your glory, and worship you in spirit and in truth. Through Jesus the Christ who lives and reigns in us. It is good to give you thanks and praise, even when in times of hardship, suffering and uncertainty, you are there among us. Your grace is always sufficient for this day and for tomorrow. Amen. We are particularly grateful for the healing and recovering that Finn, a member of the Yarrow String Quartet, has experienced. He suffered a potentially crippling cycling injury, and the Church has been praying for him. The music we are enjoying is the first time he has played with the quartet since his injury. We have much to be grateful for. Thanks be to God.
Our psalm reading for today is Psalm 138. I give thanks to you with all my heart, Lord. I sing your praise before all other gods. I, I bow toward, toward your, your holy temple and thank your name for your loyal love and faithfulness, and faithfulness because, because you have made your name and word greater than, than everything, everything else. else. On the day I cried out, you answered me. You encouraged me with inner strength. Let all the earth's rulers give thanks to you, Lord, when they hear what you say. Let them sing about the Lord's ways, because the Lord's glory is so great. Even though the Lord is high, he can still see the lowly, but God keeps his distance from the arrogant. Whenever I am in deep trouble, you make me live again. You send your power against my enemy's wrath. You save me with your strong hand. The Lord will do all this for my sake. Your, your faithful, faithful love lasts forever, forever Lord. Don't, Don't let go of what your, your hands have made. made. Summer is waning, and we've enjoyed the fruits of summer gardens and orchards. And now our thoughts are beginning to shift toward the change that autumn brings. The new school year is upon us, but the excitement for children and parents is tempered by the stubborn reality of the COVID-19 virus. I've invited one of our teachers, Sonia McNeil, to reflect with her family on the end of summer and approaching season of school. Take it away, Sonia. Hello, everyone. Here we are near the end of August, nearing the end of our summer, but still very much in the middle of this global pandemic. Many of us have been enjoying the sunshine and some fun summer activities. Mm. September is around the corner and that will bring change for a lot of families. A lot of kids will be going back to school. For a lot of us, it feels like we've been waiting to go back to school for a long time. We might have different feelings about going back to school. Maybe we're excited, maybe we're nervous, maybe we feel a bunch of different things. Maybe we feel confused. It sounds like school might look different than it used to, so that can make it hard to know what to think and feel about it all. My kids sometimes get annoyed about all the things that have changed because of COVID and frustrated that school isn't going to be the same as it used to be before COVID. To try to help us all cope with some of our feelings of frustration, we've been talking about being grateful. Eve is going to read a Bible verse from 1 Thessalonians about being grateful. Okay, everyone, I'm going to read my first verse. So, be cheerful no matter what. Pray all the time. Thank God no matter what happens. This is the way God wants you. He belongs to Jesus to live. Thank you, Eve. I'll hand it over to you. <laughs> that verse talks about being cheerful. It also talks about thanking God no matter what happens. We've been talking in our family about all the things we can do to try and have a good day. What does your first poster say, Eve? It says, let's take a look. It says, <clears throat> one day at a time. Yeah. I like to say one day at a time. It's very fun. So we try to focus on each day as it comes and try not to worry about tomorrow and next week and next month. What does your next poster say, Eve? Your next poster says, let's take a look. So, let's see. Be truthful, be kind, don't complain, don't complain. Mm -hmm. We've realized in our family that we all have a better day when each person in our family tries hard to be cheerful, to be kind to each other and not complain about things. My last poster Sad. set. Thank God, no matter what. Right. So in our family, we've been trying to focus on the good things we have and the good things we are able to do, rather than focus on what we can't do and all the things about this pandemic that frustrate us. This is what it means to thank God, no matter what. We're still able to thank God for many, many things, even in the middle of a pandemic. So in our family, we have started a gratitude box. Our box lives in our kitchen. Each day, 
uh, we each have a chance to write a little note about something we are grateful for and add it to the box. <laughs> At the end of the week, we will set aside some special family time to read over the notes and celebrate all the things we are grateful for. We'd like to share with you a few things that we are grateful for. I am grateful for having my two sisters. I am grateful for my cats. I am grateful for my garden, for my zucchini and my beans and my tomatoes and my raspberries and my plums and all my wonderful lettuce. I'm grateful for my family, particularly my children, which I, I find are very life-giving, uh, life-giving during these times. I'm grateful for my employment and I'm grateful for my faith. I am grateful for my scooter. I am grateful for my family and I am grateful for my cats and my neighbors and my life. So maybe you and your family can start a gratitude box like ours. Try to focus on one day at a time and let's remember what we have to be grateful for. Bye! Let us lift our hearts in prayer for our congregation, the church, and the community. As we pray, let us not neglect to put items of thanksgiving into our gratitude box. We pray for those involved in various school systems, in our public schools, at MEI, and at CBC, and at other post-secondary schools. For the parents and their children, for the teachers and the educational support staff who are concerned about learning and playing in a way that all can feel safe. We pray especially for those concerned with underlying health conditions. Lord, our shepherd, create an atmosphere of peace and calmness and assurance as preparations are made to reopen schools. Lord, listen to your children praying. We pray for our families and friends who are experiencing fear and uncertainty as we work at a new normal in our daily lives and activities. Help us to reach out to our neighbors with compassion and kindness. Lord, give them peace and reassurance. Lord, listen to your children pray. Let us pray for Frank Dick, father to Janet Bergen, who suffered several injuries from a fall, and for Anne, who is also in special care. Please continue praying for Margaret Ediger, Arnie and Ernie Erna Fraze, and the Friesen family, the Gunter and Johnson and Wallace families, Fred and Sue Caitler, Helen Krauss and family, Walden Neufeld and Eleanor, for John Redekup and John Taves, Hans and Mika Taves, Mary Welk and the Danzer family. Lord, listen to your children pray. We pray for our MCBC churches and for Emmanuel's leadership who are working at creating a safe place to worship and carry out church activities. We also remember the transition team and discussion groups who are discerning Emmanuel's future direction. We do not know yet what the church will look like after we begin to gather. And for Mennonite Church Canada, as they forge new ways of being faithful to your gospel and to our life and community, we pray also for Mennonite World Conference, which needs to make decisions about holding its next assembly in Indonesia next year. And as it addresses the needs of needy congregations around the world that are impacted by financial crisis. Holy Spirit, give them wisdom and hope. Lord, listen to your children pray. We pray for those who are suffering financial hardship and for those who have mental health challenges in the face of hardship, isolation and uncertainty, and for those whose physical health has been affected. Lord, Listen to your children praying. We pray for Premier John Horgan and Dr. Bonnie Henry, Adrian Dix, Minister of Education Rob Fleming. Gracious God, give them wisdom and calmness as they and others make decisions for British Columbia. Lord, 
listen to your children praying. We continue to lament the tragedy of the explosion in Beirut and the thousands who have been impacted. And for MCC and MCC's partners who are responding with compassion and with resources. Lord, hear our prayer. In response to God's merciful activity, we are to worship by living holistic, God-pleasing lives. Our values and viewpoints are not molded by the time in which we live, but are transformed by the Spirit's renewing work. Let us hear what Paul's letter to Romans has to say to us. I am reading Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. From the message translation, so here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, Fix your attention on God. You will be changed from the inside out. Rapidly recognize what He wants from you and quickly respond to it, unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. God brings the best out of you. Develops well a firm maturity in you. I am speaking to you out of the deep gratitude for all that God has given me, and especially as I have responsibilities in relations to you, leaving them as every one of you does in pure grace, it is important that you are not misinterpreted. Yourself as a people are bringing this goodness to God. No, God brings it all to you. The only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what He does for us, not by what we are and what we do for Him. The scripture passage Arnie has chosen for this message is taken from Revelations chapter 2, verses 12 to 17. I will be reading from the NIV. To the angel of the church of Pergamum write, These are the words of him, who has the sharp, double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You do not renounce your faith to me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city, where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. I'd like to begin this morning by thanking Alan and Angelica for the work that they put into preparing this service, and also to Joel for editing it, and uh, Gerald for finding some pictures to put up. Now, unlike many of you, um, the COVID crisis really didn't affect my employment at all. Uh, working in supportive care with people with developmental disabilities uh, meant that I was an essential service. 
<coughs> and then being the only maintenance person on staff at this point, uh, I was just kept that much busier. How I approached my work did change in that I only addressed emergency or uh, essential repairs. And uh, of course, I had to use the appropriate protection, uh, face mask or face shield or uh, hand gloves or what have you. Uh, like you, I've missed the interaction with family and friends, uh, not being able to go out for coffee or a meal. Uh, it's a little harder to maintain social distancing when you have grandchildren. Um, but these are all uh, inconveniences uh, that we need to deal with in order to protect one another and ourselves from this virus. Of course, there are always those who either minimize or dismiss this um, virus and the social distancing. Um, I recently saw a clip from a church that was gathering uh, without regard to any um, protective measures. And the pastor was saying <coughs> they could do this because <coughs> God gave them their rights which I was a little surprised at um, because I have never read where Thomas Jefferson climbed a mountain in West Virginia where he received the Ten Amendments, but apparently they did. In light of this, it seems strange that I would choose a text from Revelation to speak on this morning. Now, the book of Revelation was not written so that end-time prognosticators would be able to try to determine when the rapture was going to take place. It is a letter written to seven churches in Asia Minor, now Turkey, and it was a letter written during a time when they were facing persecution. It is written to them to encourage them to stay strong and to remain faithful. And these words of encouragement are important whether during times of persecution, pandemic, or any other case. Each of the seven churches are spoken to individually, but the church would have, or the letter would have circulated to all of them, so they all would have read what had been written to the other ones. Most of them are commended for their faithfulness, but they are also, in most cases, warned about some of the acts or things that they are doing or allowing that um, Jesus is not pleased with. The ch third church that's addressed is the city of Pergamum. It was the capital city of Asia Minor, a quite a large city, um, <clears throat> and it was located on the top of a mountain about a thousand feet in elevation, about 15 uh, kilometers from the Mediterranean Sea. It was um, noted for its Acropolis, which was a temple to Zeus, and this Acropolis contained an altar that measured 130 feet by 115 feet and 20 feet high. And around this altar was a carved, intricately carved marble frieze over 300 feet long. And it was made of white marble, the entire structure was. Within the city, there were also temples to Athena, to Isis, or in Greek, uh, Serapsis, and to numerous other gods. It is also the home of emperor worship. Pergamum was also the home of a library that had over 200,000 papyrus and parchment scrolls, and it had 10,000 seat stadium that was built on a hillside, and they said the acoustics of it were so wonderful that even those sitting in the topmost seats could hear the actors on the stage below very clearly. Everyone in this city where there was emperor worship was to declare that Caesar was Lord. Now, not much has changed over the years, 
there's always been those who have claimed that they need to be worshipped or honored above God. Recently, um, some articles in various publications reported that the Chinese government has sent officials around to tell Christ Christians to remove their pictures of Jesus and to replace them with pictures of Mao Zedong or the current president, Xi Jinping. Xi Jin, Xi Jinping. All of these many temples and to various pagan deities and the emperor worship combined to make Pergamum the city Jesus called the place where Satan lives. He says, I know where you live. Sometimes when someone says that, it's meant as a threat. So, you give him a check and say, I hope it doesn't bounce. And he says, oh, don't worry, I know where you live. Um, in this case, <clears throat> Jesus is saying, I'm aware of your situation. I'm aware of what you are facing in the place that you live. You are living in the place where Satan has his throne. Satan ruled Pergamum. And yet here, in this place, was a church that Jesus commends for remaining faithful even after Antipas, their, archbishop, or their bishop, had been brutally murdered by being burnt. They did not succumb to their de the demand to declare Caesar his Lord, nor did they renounce their faith in God. Throughout the history of the Church, from Stephen onward till today, many followers of Jesus have suffered abuses, torture, exile, and even cruel death. All because they refuse to renounce their faith. And there are many Anabaptists among them. Nevertheless, says Jesus, I have a few things against you. You have you hold or you have a few people who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. Likewise, you also hold or have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Now, most of us recognize the name Balaam, if nothing else, because of his donkey that spoke. Balaam had been hired by the king of Moab, Balak, to curse the Israelites. The Israelites had been wandering through the desert or the wilderness for 40 years. Now they were getting close to the promised land and so they were encamped in the Moabite area. And Balak had heard what the Israelites had done in various places in, when God was fighting for them and he feared them greatly. So he wanted to have Balaam place a curse on them that would um, to confuse them or weaken them in some way so that the Moabites and the Midianites could defeat them. But Balaam was told by God that he could not curse the Israelites. And even though he tried three times, he ended up promising blessing rather than a curse. <clears throat> and so, uh, Balaam counseled Balak to do something different. According to the Jewish historian Josephus, Balak was to choose the most beautiful women in his realm, have them dressed provocatively, and go past by the Israeli encampment, just to walk back and forth. And when an Israelite man invited her over and wished her to stay the night, she was to become coy and say, well, I would, but first you have to come and worship my God and eat some of the food that we have, which has been sacrificed to our idols. So unable to curse Israel, he got them to behave in a way that brought God's anger upon Israel in the form of a plague. Their immorality became so blatant that on one occasion, a Midianite 
brought his lover in broad daylight into the encampment, Israelite encampment and walked past Moses and others of the elders who were standing outside the tent of meeting weeping because of the plague and the sin of the people. And in broad daylight he took his lover into his family tent. Phineas, Aaron's grandson, followed the couple into the tent, took his spear, and drove it through the body of the man and into the woman. And then it said, the plague stopped. God's anger was turned away. This was not the only time that Israel had chosen to follow other gods. We have the golden calf incident earlier on. And time and again, they showed themselves to be weak and easily led astray. And now this was happening in Pergamum. Some of the Christians were going to the various temple feasts, eating food sacrificed to idols, and committing sexual sin with the temple prostitutes, or worse. Perhaps they belonged to one of the trade guilds and either had to go along or lose their jobs. Both of these were the very acts that the Council of Jerusalem had asked the Gentile Christians to avoid. And the church in Pergamum did not only have those who held to the teaching of Balaam, they also had those who followed the teaching of the Nicolaitans. The church in Ephesus is commended for hating the teachings of the Nicolaitan, which Jesus says he also hates. The teaching of the Nicolaitans was similar to that of Balaam. They engaged in the same kind of feasts and idol worship and sexual immorality that Balaam had encouraged. Now, the other thing that the Nicolaitans did was that they were identified as Gnostic. Gnosticism was a spiritual point of view that, while it was somewhat fluid in its beliefs, did see that the earth, or believed that the earth had been created by an inferior god, and that the earth itself was, was flawed. And the good world was somewhere out there, and it could be reached by one's own effort. Fifty years ago, Hebrew philosopher Martin Luther warned that a new religion was being proclaimed that would harm both Jews and Christians. This new religion was, or is, different from biblical faith because of its obsession with self, with personal development and spirituality over religion. It elevates the self above God. It idolizes the self. And we see that in some of the ways people have responded to this COVID situation, completely ignoring any personal protective measures, by partying or gathering in large groups, even in churches who claim that they were immune, and then discovered that uh, they weren't. Um, <clears throat> but it seems that we are more concerned with our personal rights than we are with caring for our neighbors. And I heard an interview where a woman who um, had apparently many lovers did so, she said, because I have to be true to myself. Paul would argue that no, at least for Christians, we belong to Christ. We are not our own. We don't have to be true to ourselves. We need to be true to Christ. In, the last, in Timothy, Paul writes, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, 
unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, have nothing to do. Or having a form of God, godliness, but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. For the early church, there could be no room to go along with the culture they were surrounded by. Compromise would ultimately destroy the church. And so Jesus calls the church in Pergamum to repent. Stop compromising. Get rid of those who are trying to lead you away from faithfulness to Jesus and who say it's okay, we aren't hurting anybody. Otherwise, I will soon come and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. The first vision that John saw was of Jesus standing in the midst of seven golden lampstands which represented the seven churches to whom the letter is addressed. His eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of a rushing, of rushing waters. In his right hand he held the seven stars. And out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. Not quite the same picture that Fran painted uh, in the 23rd Psalm. I like that one better. This portrait of Jesus is somewhat scary, but we need to have both images. If we only had the image of Jesus that John revealed, we would think that God or that Jesus was out to destroy us. And if we only have the picture of Jesus as a shepherd carrying the lamb, we may think that he is so benign that he makes no demands of us and only wants us to be happy. The double-edged sword that Jesus had coming from his mouth is his word. Paul tells the Ephesians to arm themselves with the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And the writer of Hebrews says that the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. A double-edged sword could cut either way it was wielded. God's word can either come in or it can condemn. He who has ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Pay attention to what Jesus is saying. This is important. It has eternal consequences. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. The Israelites were fed manna for 40 years in the wilderness. It was literally food from heaven. It sustained them through their wilderness wanderings until they entered the promised land. It strengthened them, and like that, it will the hidden manna, the bread of life, to Jesus himself will strengthen and sustain the faithful members of the church in Pergamum and among the church today. Even as the church in Pergamum was trying to, uh, to be salt and light in the very place where Satan had his throne. I will also give him a white stone with the name written on it, known only to him who received it. White stone, or marble, was very common in Pergamum. And white stones were used in a variety of ways, um, but one way in particular was that it was used in voting. A white stone meant that you were in favor, and a, a black stone meant you disapproved. Antipas when he faced a vote by those who were judging him, in likelihood received all black votes, which meant that he would be executed. To receive a white stone from Jesus 
means an invitation. It means that Jesus is for us, that he is fighting on our behalf. To be given a new name is to be given a new identity. To be given the identity by which God sees us. In the Old Testament, God changed the name of Abram to Abraham, and Sarah, Sarai, became Sarah. But in the New Testament, Cephas became Peter, and these new names changed them. The new name is the name God knows you by. He gives everyone to remain faithful a new name that reflects what he sees in you. He has adopted you. You belong to him. The COVID crisis has given us something we didn't have much of before. It has given us time. There are a few places to go, less things to do. Shopping is usually just the necessities or it's done online. And eventually, I think even Netflix becomes tiresome. And you can only read so much. But it should give us this time as well, or we can take some of this time to seriously reflect on our relationship with Christ. To ask myself, you need to ask yourself, am I remaining true to his name? Or have I allowed myself to be seduced by the surrounding culture? Do I need to repent? Or have I received the stone, the white stone, with a new name on it? At times we do well to reflect on our walk with our faith. Confession is good and necessary for our spiritual and emotional well-being. O oh God of mercy and grace, you alone know how often we have wandered from your ways. In, in praising that which is not praiseworthy, in forgetting your love and the love of neighbor, in serving causes that lead us away from you, and in bowing to our cultures' deities. In your great compassion, forgive us and restore our ways. Set us free from a past that we cannot change, Open, open to us a future in which we can be changed, and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen.
For our benediction and words of sending, I have taken the text from Don Bessick's benediction anthem. Go now in peace, never be afraid. God will go with you every hour of every day. Go now in faith, steadfast, strong, and true. Know he will guide you in all that you do. Go now in love and show you believe. Reach out to others so all the world can see. God will be there watching from above. Go now in peace, in faith, and in love. After our final song, I would like to invite you to stay with the service for a few minutes longer in preparation to leave your sanctuary of worship as the Yarrow String Quartet plays. Go now in peace, go now in peace, may the love of God surround you everywhere, everywhere you may go. Go now in peace, go now in peace, go now in love Go now in peace.